Welcome to the European Parliamentary Research Service Podcasts. In this podcast, we'll talk about Russia's brutal expansionism, analyze its impact on the EU, and discuss different scenarios on Russia's possible behavior in the next years, up to 2030. Geopolitics is back. Will he? No, he wouldn't dare. Well, he actually might. Doubts about Putin's real intentions in Ukraine were quickly dispelled on the 24th of February, as he announced a special military operation to, in his own words, demilitarize and denazify Ukraine. Only minutes later, missiles and airstrikes hit across the country, including the capital, Kiev. A full-blown invasion had begun. In response to this unprovoked attack on Ukraine, the EU together with its allies agreed on massive sanctions, including an oil ban to hit its economic base, maximize the political cost for Russia's political elite responsible for the invasion, and cripple the Kremlin's ability to finance the war. And what's more, agreed on 2 billion euros assistance to the Ukrainian armed forces under the European Peace Facility. The war on Ukraine is the latest manifestation of Russia's revisionist policy over the past decade, but not the only one. In 2014, it seized and illegally annexed Crimea and, encouraged by the shy international response, orchestrated a series of pro-Russian uprisings throughout the south and east of the country, prompting a war between Ukraine and Russian-backed separatists in the Donbass. In response, Russia's G8 membership was suspended and political dialogue with the EU and other world democracies was brought to an abrupt halt. EU member states agreed on some sanctions, but that didn't stop Putin. Early in 2021, he began to amass troops on the Ukrainian border, raising the first alarms in both the EU and NATO. By the end of the year, he had suspended its diplomatic mission to NATO and asked the US and NATO for security guarantees, including a legally binding promise that Ukraine would not join NATO, as well as a reduction in NATO troops and military presence in Eastern Europe. A call, some may say a threat, that was rejected by the EU, NATO and the US with equal determination and unity. Another setback for Putin. But that didn't stop him either. Truth is, Russia has increasingly been using hybrid warfare tactics to gain strategic leverage. In the autumn of 2021, it masterminded an artificial migrant crisis at Belarus's border with Poland to destabilize the EU. And it's using disinformation and cyber warfare to undermine Western democracies. Knowing how dependent some EU countries are on its gas and oil... Russia is using energy as an economic and geopolitical weapon. So, what risks does this pose for the EU and how should we go about them? Well, energy price volatility and supply shortages pose a serious risk for the EU. There are things that can be done in the short term to dampen shocks and protect consumers, as we're seeing now. But the only sustainable solution involves cutting dependency from Russia and diversifying supply. In 2021, the EU imported more than 40% of its total gas consumption, 27% of oil imports and 46% of coal imports from Russia. But the EU's prosperity and security depend on a stable and affordable energy supply. So... In March 2022, the European Commission presented its Repower EU strategy, outlining measures to drastically reduce Russian gas imports by the end of this year and make Europe completely independent from Russian fossil fuels by the end of the decade. Here's President Ursula von der Leyen. We have to get rid of the dependency of Russian gas, oil and coal to repower the European Union. Repower means massive investment in renewables like solar, wind and hydrogen. So we are looking for a focused acceleration of the European Green Deal. Next to cutting dependency from Russia and diversifying supply, better integration of the single market in energy, gas storage targets, joint procurement and greater interconnection between EU countries would further reduce energy risks. And another risk 
The risk of a non-intended full-scale conflict is growing as Russia multiplies conflicts in the EU's neighbourhood. NATO remains the main defence and deterrence tool for most EU countries, but the EU is finally taking its security into its own hands, with a clear plan to bolster its security and defence capabilities. The strategic compass, endorsed by the European Council last March, sets a roadmap for becoming a stronger security and defence actor and strengthens resilience in the face of new geopolitical threats. A few weeks earlier, during their meeting in Versailles, EU leaders reaffirmed the same message. Let's hear two extracts from French President Emmanuel Macron and the President of the European Council, Charles Michel, during the final press conference. Everywhere around the European continent, historic choices are being made, and this is a major turning point. We need to have the organisation so that we can build this joint ambition in defence. The actions uh, taken over the last few days, in fact, uh, consecrate uh, the emergence of a European defence. It has formally been initiated through the meeting today in Versailles, and we have now an operational strategy in which we will identify the actions and investments that are going to be necessary. The Versailles Declaration announces the EU's intention not only to bolster defence capabilities, but also to become autonomous in food, energy and to build a more robust economic base. But our societies and democracies will continue to be at risk as long as Russia continues its cyber and hybrid activities, including through the instrumentalisation of migration, the funding of anti-democratic political parties and organisations and disinformation campaigns. So, what can the EU do to counter these risks? Here's Susanna Angel from the European Parliamentary Research Service. To counter these risks, the EU needs to enhance its resilience by strengthening its security and defence, its economy and its ability to fight disinformation. To do so, the Union has already strengthened its sanctions framework, has agreed on an action plan against disinformation especially that originating in Russia. More needs to be done. The EU-NATO declaration, now in preparation, could enable both organizations to further step up their joint efforts to counter disinformation and hybrid threats. So how can we expect Russia to behave in the coming years? Let's analyze three different scenarios, based on how far in the direction of conflict or cooperation and democratization or more authoritarianism Russia decides to move. The most perilous scenario is unfolding as Russia conducts its war on Ukraine, continues to use its military force and keeps the nuclear threat alive. In this scenario, Russia may try to heat up protracted conflicts in the EU's neighbourhood to destabilise the bloc and further intensify its cyber and hybrid activities against the EU and NATO, including disinformation campaigns. Damaged by the massive sanctions imposed by the EU and the US, among other countries, Russia would become even more centralised and authoritarian. In this scenario, the EU would continue dealing with a massive influx of Ukrainian refugees and pursue its strategic autonomy goals in the economy, energy and security sectors and keep a close eye on the evolution of the war and its spillover potential. But Russia could also move towards a frozen scenario. Here we're assuming the war in Ukraine has ended, but Russia together with the Belarusian regime continues to multiply its cyber and hybrid aggressions to destabilize the EU. Putin would continue crushing on civil society and political opponents, bringing the nationalistic rhetoric up a notch. In this scenario, Russia may continue to instrumentalize migration, but won't be able to use energy as a weapon, as the EU will have learned the lesson and diversified supply. Russia will remain an international pariah and high-level political dialogue with the EU and other world democracies will remain frozen. But Russia may also reverse course and begin to de-escalate tensions and cooperate with the EU. Susanna Angel runs us through the main points of this more cooperative scenario. As a consequence of the war, Russia goes through a severe economic crisis which endangers 
the regime's survival. Domestic pressure triggers reforms, possibly democratization. In this context, Russia abandons its revisionist policy, agrees to cooperate with international justice on the investigation of war crimes perpetrated in Ukraine and calls for the reopening of the high-level political dialogue with the EU and democratic countries worldwide. Although this would clearly be the most desirable scenario, only time will tell in which direction Russia is going to move and how this will impact all of us. For a more thorough analysis, check out Susanna Angle's full policy brief on the EPRS website or in our app. This is a European Parliamentary Research Service podcast. Thanks for listening.